Good morning. My name is John Claney, and on behalf of First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware, I welcome you to our online worship service. All are welcome here, where we yearn to know the full breadth of human experience. We celebrate the richness that diversity brings to our congregation, including age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, economic status, and theological beliefs. Since we will not be gathering in person, your program staff, Reverend Larry Pierce, Catherine Williamson, Kathy Harris, and I thought it would be fun to venture out a bit. So this Christmas morning, we'll be enjoying the hospitality of several First U members at various locations. The context of our spiritual exploration will be the words of Reverend Howard Thurman. And to start us off, here's worship associate Jan Che. Christmas Returns. Christmas returns as it always does, with its assurance that life is good. It is the time of lift to the spirit, when the mind feels its way into the commonplace and senses the wonder of simple things, an evergreen tree, familiar carols, merry laughter, it is the time of illumination, when candles burn and old dreams find their youth again. It is the time of pause, when forgotten joys come back to mind and past dedications renew their claim. It is the time of harvest of the heart, when faith reached out to mantle all high endeavor and love whispers its magic word to everything that breathes. Christmas returns as it always does with its assurance that life is good. If you would like to join me in lighting a chalice, please get ready to do so while I read these words. You will light candles this Christmas Candles of joy, despite all the sadness. Candles of hope, where despair keeps watch. Candles of courage, for fears ever present. Candles of peace, for tempest-tossed days. Candles of grace, to ease heavy burdens. Candles of love, to inspire all my living. Candles that will burn all year long.
I don't know what you might know already about Howard Thurman, but he was a, he still is a wisdom figure for many people, but uh, he was particularly a spiritual teacher and mentor to some of those that we know in the civil rights movement during the, during the 60s. So uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said that he often carried one of Howard Thurman's books with him when he traveled. And, uh, Marion Wright Elderman, Elderman, I think I got that right, uh, also, uh, who founded the Children's Defense Fund. She also saw him as a figure as well. He uh, was um, a dean at Boston University School of Theology before I went there. Uh, and so there's a whole collection of his writings and so forth that, that reside there. Some interesting things about him was that he started the first multiracial, uh, multi-religious congregation in the United States in San Francisco. And uh, that congregation was called A Church for All Peoples. And, um, and it has been served by many Unitarian ministers over the years as well. He's an interesting character in the sense that he brings together a blend of a commitment to social justice as well as a mystic sensibility uh, in a way that uh, brings together both uh, deep feeling as well as committed action. And uh, there's a story that's told about him when he met with a group of young uh, African-American women, uh, women and men. And after he uh, met with them, they said, we thought we were going to be meeting with a prophet, but instead we've met with a mystic. <laughs> but I think the truth of the matter is, is that both of those informed who it is that he was. So I'm going to just wanted to give you that, that kind of context before I share these reflections, which build on the reading that uh, Helen did on Christmas. Okay. For many devout Christians all over the world, December 25th, marks a dramatic moment in the series of dramatic moments by which the will of God has manifested itself within the time-space involvements of human life. They regard the birth of Jesus as a moment when God was introduced into time in the form of this incarnation. Many other Christians are sure that this day marks the birth of a baby who grew up to be a good man, one of the best men who ever lived a man who in tenderness, in graciousness, and in sensitivity set a new record for the meaning and the worth of the individual. Many others regard him as one who came into the world as anyone else comes into the world, and as the result of the way he lived and the intensity of his experience of God, he became more and more available to the mind and the spirit and to the will of God, and he achieved a sonship which was not his at birth. It doesn't matter from one point of view which one of these orientations is yours. Or it matters a great deal. But the important thing is that to the mother of Jesus, he was a baby boy who grew hungry, who had to be fed, bathed, nurtured, who had to be given tender loving care, one who pulled at her heartstrings and who became so much a part of her sense of worth and meaning that she was sure, in a sense, that this was the first baby in the world. And perhaps every mother feels, particularly about her first baby, that this is the first, this is the original baby. And this can be understood. When we think of Christmas, let us think of it as a time when we remember the graces of life. It is important to seize upon the atmosphere created during this period to let it tutor our own spirits in kindness and in imaginative sympathy. 
Joy is of many kinds. Sometimes it comes silently, opening all closed doors and making itself at home in the desolate heart. It has no forerunner save itself. It brings its own welcome and salutation. Sometimes joy is compounded of many elements, a touch of sadness, a whimper of pain, a harsh word tenderly held until its arrogance dies, the casting of an eye into the face that understands, the clasp of a hand that holds, then releases a murmur of tenderness where no word is spoken, the distilled moment of remembrance of a day, a night, an hour, lived beyond the sweep of the daily round, Joy is often compounded of many things. There is earned joy, an impossible job tackled and conquered, leaving no energy for assessing the price or measuring the cost, only an all-inclusive sense of well-being in the mind, and slowly creeping through all the crevices of the spirit. Or it may be some dread has reared its head, gathering into itself all hope that is unassigned until it becomes master of the house. Then relief comes through fresh knowledge, new insight, clearer vision. What was dread now proves groundless, and the heart takes to wings like an eagle in its flight. There is joy that is given. There are those who have in themselves the gift of joy. It has no relation to merit or demerit. It is not a quality. They have rested from the vicissitudes of life. Such people have not fought and won a hard battle. They have made no conquest. To them, joy is given as a precious ingredient in life. Wherever they go, they give birth to joy in others. They are the heavenly troubadours, earthbound, who spread their music all around and who sing their song without words and without sounds. To be touched by them is to be blessed of God. They give even as they have been given. Their presence is a benediction and a grace. In them we hear the music, in the score, and in their faces we sense a glory which is the very light of heaven. The Mood of Christmas by Howard Thurman. Christmas is a mood, a quality, a symbol. It is never really a fact. As a fact, it is a date on the calendar. To the believer, it is the anniversary of an event in human history. The mood of Christmas, what is it? It is the quickening of the presence of other human beings into whose lives a precious part of one's own has been released. It is a memory of other days when into one's path an angel appeared spreading a halo over an ordinary moment or a commonplace event. It is an iridescence of sheer delight that bathes one's whole being into something more wonderful than words can ever tell. Of such is the mood of Christmas. The quality of Christmas, what is it? It is the fullness of which fruit ripens, blossoms untold into flowers, and live coals glow in the darkness. It is the richness of vibrant colors, calm purple of grape, the exciting redness of tomatoes, a shimmering light on the noiseless stirring of a lake or sunset. 
It is the sense of plateau with a large rock behind which one may take temporary respite from winds that chill. Of such is the quality of Christmas. The symbol of Christmas, what is it? It is the brooding presence of the eternal spirit making crooked paths straight, rough places smooth, tired hearts refreshed, dead hopes stir with the newness of life. It is the promise of tomorrow. At the close of every day, the movement of life in defiance of death and the assurance that life is sturdier than hate, that right is more confident than wrong, that good is more permanent than evil. So I wanted to reflect with you today on the reading that Howard shared with us from Howard Thurman's book, The Mood of Christmas. And as I read that reading myself, it brought me to some memories of a time when I was in Ireland. And this was just a two-week vacation several years ago. And I remember being surprised by two things. The first thing was the food was much better than I had ever expected it <laughs> to be. You see, since my mother was Italian, who did most of the cooking, and my father was Irish, I never really experienced Irish food that much, but when I did, it seemed to be nothing more spectacular than boiled potatoes, overboiled green, greenish cabbage, and mushy, orange-like carrots. All infused with a lot of salt to make it pal. So on that trip, however, I realized that in order to be a vital, thriving economy in the European Union, that Ireland had trained troops of chefs. And Ireland had entered the culinary competition and put a significant economic stake in tourism for its future. So my prejudgment about Irish food dissipated when I realized what it had actually become. Now, the other surprise occurred to me unexpectedly on an early morning walk in the center of Dublin. Here it was, November 1st, and there they were, a crew of workers who were putting up bright white Christmas lights and garlic of evergreen along the pedestrian area and shopping area, November 1st. I was surprised, you know, for sure. I mean, after all, it was November 1st. Did I say that already? <laughs> <laughs> and they were already decorating for Christmas. This reaction was tinged with a little cynicism on my part as I thought, I guess there is no escaping the commercialism of Christmas, no matter where you are in the world. It's happening even here. And indeed, while some count the gradual progression of Advent candles towards Christmas, towards a slow progression towards Christmas, most of us can actually get very caught up in counting the number of shopping days before Christmas. Now, I may have even mumbled to myself as I saw that scene with them putting up the, the, the lights and the garlands of evergreen. It's nothing. It's nothing sacred. Because I really thought it was just a commercial kind of event. But then, when I settled down and I had a cup of coffee in a cafe, another mood arose in me. I still could see the very same event from my seat in the cafe. A crew of workers hanging tiny white uh, lights in the center of the city, in the center city area. A team of workers hanging up right 
lights and garlands of evergreen. In contrast to my previous prejudgment of it all, I found myself starting to take a delight, a delight in the twinkling lights and the festive decorations. I was warming to the idea of how nice it was that this ubiquitous celebration with universal symbols of twinkling lights and evergreens can connect with something within us and beyond. They can connect with us no matter what our backgrounds. There is something universal in this that I began to appreciate in that moment. As the Christmas lights were illuminating on the street, as if they were faraway stars that had entered our paths of every day, as if the evergreen gardens danced across the streets, they seemed to defy an inevitable beginning of a gloomy winter chill. As part of me still thought what an unnecessary and untimely extravagance. <laughs> Another part of me slowly warmed to the generosity of this extravagance. Here on this common city square, all could enjoy the extravagance of lights and evergreens. All of this was available to do its own subtle magic in these ordinary space, in these ordinary walkways in the city, there was grace to be simply received, available to all, available to be received within each person that could receive it. Now, my original cynical and critical position seemed to dissolve on its own like the sugar in my coffee. I could rest in the warmth and graciously receive this mood of Christmas that arrived unexpectedly within me. In the reading by Howard Thurman, The Mood of Christmas, and the other readings by Thurman offered by members in this video, there's a recognition that what seems particular to Christmas is only an amping up of what is already, always there, ready to be recognized and realized. Thurman points out in, his, in the reading that the mood of Christmas is a memory of other days when into one's path an angel appeared spreading a halo over an ordinary moment or a commonplace event. suspect many of us have unexpectedly received those halos that just seem to appear over an ordinary moment or an ordinary commonplace event. That was my experience, really, as my mood shifted while viewing the same ordinary event of crews hanging lights and evergreens on a city street. And don't we oftentimes have that experience as well. When what first seemed ordinary or commonplace can appear all at once to us as if illumined by a halo, to use Thurman's words. Moments when the fragility of life can also fill us with the wonder that life simply is. Or, Moments when a daily sunrise can unfold before us as if we are seeing the sunrise with its array of color, its gradual revelation, its simple but magnificent splendor, as if we are seeing that sunrise for the very first time. Moments when we take the hand of our beloved or hold their memory close to our heart and feel a gratitude for this companionship that otherwise we might simply take for granted. Moments when 
such as this, when it seems like a random assortment of humanity is gathered in one place. Ordinary, until with the mystic sensibility, we can sense the tangible and the visible. We can appreciate all the connections that led us to this particular moment, to be here together. We can appreciate the tangible and wondrous that has woven us together in a community into this moment. Not just any moment, but a sacred moment that we've never lived or experienced before. Howard Thurman was and is a wisdom figure that's inspired many beyond just those he uh, engaged in his work on social justice and civil rights during their time. He was able to see the ordinary conditions of life and extraordinary possibilities, wanting to be realized, wanting to be revealed. He wrote these words, which I've adapted just a bit. The mystic is no coward sticking their head in the sand, praying to God because they are scared or because they do not have the nerve to do anything else. But the mystic is sure that they are in touch with tremendous energy. And if they can be a point of focus through which that energy has its mark in the world, then the redemptive, liberatory process can work in and through them. So it's no surprise to me that Thurman compiled a book entitled The Mood of Christmas, from which we've drawn our readings for this, this video. Since Christmas is a reminder that's tucked into our darkest days, that we can take a time to recall now and then. We may take a time any day to recall what we might otherwise take for granted, what we might have otherwise tucked away, where we can recognize that we often breathe in mystery, that we are surrounded by wonder, that miracles abound even in the most ordinary things. May Christmas be that time of remembering and recalling for each of us so that we are strengthened by an inner knowing, so that we are propelled by a higher resolve to do what Thurman called the work of Christmas every day, starting now. The Growing Edge. All around us, worlds are dying and new worlds are being born. All around us, life is dying and new life is being born. The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth against the time when there shall be new leaves, fresh blossoms, green fruit. Such is the growing edge. It is the extra breath from the exhausted lung, the one more thing to try when all else has failed the upward reach of life when weariness closes in upon all endeavor. This is the basis of hope in moments of despair, the incentive to carry on when times are out of joint and men have lost their reason, the source of confidence when worlds crash and dreams whiten into ash. The birth of a child. Life's most dramatic answer to death. This is the growing edge incarnate. Look well to the growing edge. This reading is called The Work of Christmas by Howard Thurman. When the songs of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. Our time together this morning has come to an end. 
Let's extinguish our chalices to these words from Maggie Lovins. We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Go in peace, be of service to one another, and may you move through the world in love for all of your days. Go!